So next up is a CXO and a CSO from an agency that I've been told is pretty good. Um, it's Karen Boswell uh, from VML YNR. She's the EMEA Chief Experience Officer and Tomasz Gonsorczyk, who's the Chief Strategy Officer of VML YNR New York. Um, they're going to share uh, a new strategy ethos and some practical tools uh, rooted in science, design thinking, and human-centered design in corporate. Um, and so, yeah, let's welcome them to the stage. Apparently yesterday there were lots of really insightful uh, charts around um, change. And I think we just heard over there from Ingrid there was a really nice bridge into what we're going to talk about. She talked about the fact that change is slow. Whether it's slow, whether it's fast, it's definitely the only constant. Um, and my benchmark when I talk to clients is uh, the late, great Steve Jobs. He talked about cannibalizing yourself, because if you don't, then others will. Am I clicking on, or? Sorry, I don't know if this is working. Or do I just signal? Otherwise, it might be quite painful. <laughs> in a row. Um, if it's full, then it's really bad. Um, when we talk about change uh, at BML YNR, we talk about creating connected brands. Um, and when we talk about running our teams, we talk about creating connected experiences. And essentially, that's understanding how we can connect all the dots in a very intricately woven world to keep up with the pace of life that we are facing. Um, and when we look at that pace of life, it's been pretty busy. So this is the whole of the internet on one chart. Now for any of you digital natives like I am, I've been working in this industry for 20 years, you probably started your careers in web 1.0, the web of content. Pretty transactional, pretty straightforward, it quickly progressed into what was a big explosion, web 2, the web of comms, and that's when we started to see the birth of Facebook, the uprise of user-generated content, um, we saw video, we saw blogs, we just had a wonderful chat from somebody who's kind of nurtured that and turned it into a career. We moved into Web3, which is a little bit more subtle. That's when we started to see data starting to understand us, starting to connect the dots between three screens in a world where we were used to doing design for perhaps a tablet, a laptop, when we thought that the internet was contained in devices that we were using to explore things. Semantic interfaces started to intuitively know what we wanted to see next and start to give that to us before we knew that we wanted it. And now today we talk about the Internet of Things, Web 4, and that's where we start to see the boundaries being pushed. You'll hear phrases like clicks and bricks coming together. We'll talk about converting footfall. You know if you walk into um, a Walmart uh, or a Boots, if you can't get your product there, you'll get it on Amazon and it will be at your home tomorrow. Uh, and probably next year it will be following you in a drone, dropping it off as you step onto the bus within the hour, which is creepy but possible. Um, and we're heading to Web 5, which is the web of thought. Uh, and I do believe that in our lifetimes, certainly looking around the room all of our lifetimes, we will be stood side by side with sentient robots before our careers end, because they exist. The infrastructure just isn't that. The whole point of this chart is that quite often when we talk about change, we're talking about designing for Web 4 when most of the businesses and the clients that we talk to are 20 years out of date before we even get going, because they're stuck in Web 2. Um, I had breakfast this morning with the president of a, a big pharmaceutical company, um, and he's actually facing change within his organization, and he's seen the need to break down digital teams, traditional teams, manufacturing teams, production teams, and put an experienced team at the very heart of it, and that's something that we're helping him hire and build together. So when we think about all of this, and we talk about consumers, that means that the consumer journey, which I guess for traditional fans in the room is normally quite an A to B process, perhaps a linear thing. We may be, thought, may be thinking swim lanes, perhaps we're talking about 360 connected ecosystems. That's not how real people consume. It's not how I consume. I doubt it's how you consume. It stops, it starts, it changes. You'll change your mind, you'll have a conversation, you'll walk into a store, you'll research something online. And let's face it, we're an emotional bunch. So when we talk about connected experiences and designing and winning in this age, we generally make sure that any technology we use is, to quote Arthur C. Clarke, indistinguishable from magic. And so we try and transcend the function and focus on the emotion. 
and do those things in a way that we believe can actually start, here's the good news in this incredibly complex situation that we're facing, starts with one simple question. And that's, what are we empowering our consumers to do today that they could not do before? And it's the single biggest mindset shift that you will see from a brand that is broadcasting a thing that they think that they need to talk about to truly understanding a consumer need or desire. It's the green button. The big, the big one? <laughs> None of the others, I've tried them, it doesn't okay, work. Let's do, let's do this. Um, hi there. Um, it's quite simple, as Karen said, I think, at the end of the day, I think, as you have mentioned too, I think it's quite fuzzy, right? Talk about experience and building our skill set and, you know, end of marketing and engineering growth now and stuff like that. Um, but it's quite simple. And that is, I think, when we look at our jobs every day, I think it's really to meaningfully connect brands to people. And I'm going to use the hardworking um, tool of a framework um, to bring it to life. Um, that's the end of the build um, in this instance, because I think it's this simple, right? And at the end of the day, there are some well-meaning product designers, engineers within our brands that we work with. They create something of value. And then there are some people out there in the world with disposable income or you know, need to feed themselves, provide something to their families. They're willing to exchange money for goods and services. And it's that simple. But I think the reason why I think our industry is disrupted, why I think we all feel this kind of sense of anxiety about where all of this is going, is because um, the world is changing. And I think we love the, the, the title of, um, of this conference, right, Heart of the People, because what we're hearing from many of the most senior people in the marketing world is that the very profound nature of how brands and people connect is changing. I'm just going to read this because I love this quote so much. Food is politics, consumption is political. Each time we eat and drink, we vote for the world we want. And that to me is extremely profound because it puts emphasis on us strategies to truly represent what matters to people. And I really mean it truly without any compromise um, as to what really matters to people. So um, you know, I think the title of our talk is Winning in the Age of Experience. So well, I could go quite hard in terms of the tech talk for the strategies that you would like. But I honestly believe that if our job is to understand people and then connect those people to the brands in the world and create markets on the back of that, I think we're really well positioned to drive change forward and be one of the most valuable resources in this entire ecosystem of agencies, clients, and suppliers, and all of that stuff. Um, so what are those key tools or kind of frames of reference that we need to have in, with us um, in our everyday? I'll start with some macro topics that we believe are critical to understand and really dive into. First of all, um, data. Um, I think there's a data summit down the forest that puts on as well. So um, it's so critical. But I think the angle that I think strategists can take is to be, of course, quite suspicious of it. And that is to say, I think, you know, consumers are deeply and profoundly uncomfortable with how technology platforms, brands, and uh, agencies as well manipulate their own personal information. The reason why regulation is going into effect in Europe, in California, and will come into effect in the US as well is because people are really uncomfortable with how all of this is happening. I think there, there are stats that if you start to put data tax on major big tech companies out there, every one of us could get $300 a year in a check um, for the use of our own information. I think it's talking about value exchange. You know, that's, that's actual tangible money that should be, that should be ours. And then secondly, I think it's important whether you're an account planner, data scientist, or media planner to really appreciate the fact that attention economy is kind of broken as you stare at the goldfish and, you know, your mind shifts away from what I'm saying. I think it's just true that I think people are really struggling to pay attention because they're five devices. I think they are really struggling to absorb the stories that we are so desperately and diligently trying to craft for them. In the latest Nielsen report, the average attention span of a Gen Z is less than a goldfish. <laughs> nice. Um, now you might wonder why, I used, why Steve Carell talked about marketing technology. And that is, um, I think for someone that's been around so many technology implementations over the years, most of them truly never get pulled off because it's just really hard um, and the whole, the whole personalization at scale just doesn't really work, does it? So I think what, what happens more often than not is brands end up talking to people, kind of guessing what matters to them, guessing where they're from, and it's just a bit odd, isn't it? A bit awkward. 
And I think lastly, I think we've all probably had a purpose brief on our desks uh, in the last week or two, I imagine. Um, we believe that this is a result of systemic decline in trust that people have in institutions and brands in the world over the last 20 years. And not only um, people feel that brands do not have their best interest in mind, they actually work actively against them. Um, I think it's very important for us to be, again, staying with the people when we talk to, when we design marketing solutions for our clients. Um, back to my chart. Now it's going to be built. Uh, that was a joke that I named it. Of course, planning needs to have a framework. Um, to me, in terms of I think, skills that are really critical in building, rebuilding that connection, repairing a lot of the breakages that happen, first of all, we need to be really great at understanding content. And that, to me, includes advertising, and includes stories that we tell on social, and all the other channels. What are the stories that we're telling on behalf of the brand? Then secondly, I think for a modern planner, it's extremely important to understand how people actually buy, whether it's through Amazon or direct to consumer, understanding what frictionless purchase looks like and designing around it is extremely, extremely important. And then lastly, I think it's so interesting, you know, the majority of marketing spend is spent on kind of sweating the rock of the, the funnel and we forget about what happens to the people once they actually buy our product. <laughs> Investing in the experience itself is incredibly, incredibly important because that allows us to actually learn about what matters to people. Um, and then some soft things. I think I would say that in this age of experience, what, what we have as strategies that is our most valuable asset, it's our perspective. Nurture it, hone it, make it the only thing that matters in our careers. Because if we can stand in the room of people and present a perspective that compels you to maybe change one thing about the way you operate tomorrow, then I think we are, we are winning. And then secondly, own it. How often do you feel that your thinking and your work is compromised. Ah, this is too hard, you know, that, you know, it's risky, hasn't been proven, where's the data to prove it? We just have to own, if we've researched what the point of view should be and what the, what the perspective is, let's own it, because that's, again, the only <coughs> thing that matters. And then lastly, I think, you know, um, I have a bit of a beef with this notion of planners in our, uh, you know, we don't really know what we're doing, you know, we're timid. Um, if we understand the consumer, and if we understand how markets are made around, those, around people, I think we should have some swagger when we talk about it. Because um, I think it's really important, right? If we don't have the confidence in what people actually want from brands, then who else should, should do that? Um, so please, let's have some swagger. Because I think it's fun, too. Um, Can you show us your swagger? I'm sorry? Can you show us your swagger? Um, uh, for that presentation. <laughs> um, okay, okay, okay. Um, and now some hard-working frameworks. Okay, uh, if you want to get your phones out, this is going to be quite fun. Um, so I think there, there's a foundational construct for, um, for how we would like to propose that we think about experience and managing experience here. Um, it is something like this, you know, very easy to digest um, um, set, of, set of boxes that I think, um, if you're a strategist um, and you love what you do, that I, I'm sure this is, this is very enjoyable. So let me just go through this a little bit. Um, I think, you know, when you hear a lot about digital and kind of marketing and touch points and operating within a silo, I think the only channel, notion of only channel has been the biggest buzzword, I think, in that world over the last few years. And I think what this led to is that every single brand and every single category has got really good touch points out there. They're building this website, some kind of a social presence, maybe there is a kind of in-store solution in place, but it's really we've hit parity when it comes to the kind of omni-channel presence. What I think really matters, um, and I think it's for us as strategies to, to lead this effort, is to rethink the experience that we put around people, around products and services that coordinate out of marketing, and allow us to build a tighter and closer relationship between brands and people. I think that, of course, happens on the back of what's the vision that we're painting for this brand, right, in the world, around its products, around its overall mission, around its purpose. And ultimately, if none of that has a meaningful role in people's lives, um, then, you know, why bother? And also, why bother if it doesn't create any value for, for the brand? So I think this, uh, this intersection of what's someone's journey in their life, um, what are the products and services that the brand offers, out of that comes the vision for how we should rethink the experience around, around the consumer. Um, that's the experience. And if that wasn't enough, I think for, um, for us as strategists, um, I think we also need to be pretty good with some things that are, I think, like, historically quite uncomfortable, right? Technology, e-commerce, CRM, product management, all that stuff. 
Because if we are the most trusted advisors to the CMO in the room, then they are the biggest spenders on technology in their organizations. So we should at least be dangerous enough to navigate the decisions and the conversation. Knowing that it's probably not enough to actually implement some, it'll be marketing suite, but we should at least um, feel comfortable talking about it. Um, and I think in totality, for us, this intersection of real understanding of how to drive marketing at scale through technology, with rethinking how we engage in the experience um, through being people first, I think that's where we believe magic happens. Um, I think to make it, to make it more specific, I think. So there's a lot of jumping in points there, and uh, as, a, as a point again of reassurance, I think um, when we, the reason we start with the known things is it just helps us understand how we get going. And quite often what will happen is our known thing might be, oh, we need to fix our platform. We've just brought the Adobe license. We've just brought the Cycle license. We don't know what to do with it. It might be, to Tamarsh's point, well, our website doesn't look like the 17 apps that we have, and that's just the UK, and then actually we're a mere wife. This is my job every day. Uh, so there's 39 countries and several different languages, and oh, actually, we're global. Um, and so we've got 186 different touch points, and that's just for this one car. And you're like, ah, OK. Whatever it is, whatever we're jumping in, however we're trying to get to better know things, um, we always, as we get complicated, like to get incredibly simple again. So we just seek for the shared value. Um, and that starts with people. You'll hear us say this time and time again. And theoretically, as humans, we are already part expert in doing all of this. So where do we find the meaningful value for people, but never losing sight of where sustainable growth and value for our businesses are? Because at the end of the day, pretty much all of our clients have something to sell in one way or another. And that comes down to three things for us. Um, I don't know whether you're familiar with the humanization trends. Essentially, it's about getting to know me, valuing my time, and then helping me win at life. So Nike, their entire business model is built around know me to serve me. Tell me what I want before I even know I want it. And that is essentially the age that enriches um, experience. So whether that's a physical thing, a digital thing, it's all about enriching that person's life. Then we need to look at, does it actually genuinely contribute to the top line and the bottom line? Are we building brand strength and stature? Are we building revenue? Are we making money? Is this going to be a sustainable thing, not just a thingy, because there's a thing that we want to do and you know, have some chat about the thing. You know, VR thingies, AI thingies, I get those groups a lot. Can it actually be adopted? You've had that brief too. Somebody laughed as well. Can it be adopted? Are our users going to want it, need it, desire it, come back to it every day, every week, every month? Can we actually do it? And sometimes you get all the way down to this bit and then you kind of go, oh, shit, I can't actually do it. <laughs> so it's good to make sure that we're sitting in the sweet spot in the middle of all of that. That helps us work out what our direction of change is, um, which is the easy bit. Uh, and then essentially, um, we have some tools for helping us navigate through our vision and our roadmap for getting to change. So you've probably all seen one of these. This is a fairly straightforward tool. It's what we call an infinity loop. Um, in the, what I like to call the olden days, I hope I'm not offending anybody with this, in traditional marketing days, um, this would have been quite linear. Uh, and then it sort of evolved, and marketing broad, uh, brand broadcast would cover this sort of first half of the loop. And you would see probably a leaky bucket model that would talk about reach and awareness, conversion, consideration, uh, then we're going to get them to buy, and then there's like that triangle on the bottom where we decide to be loyal to our customers because they bought something from us. <laughs> not really the world we live in anymore. Um, we tend to start with being loyal to our customers before we expect loyalty from them in return, and that means we need to identify their need quite early on. So yes, there is absolutely a need for advertising and marketing. Of course there is. Especially with mass brands, you need to have a mass reach and awareness. But the journey starts so much earlier on about understanding what your consumers want, and then helping them go through some research, navigating the tsunami of content that is on the internet. Um, I was talking to a, a, a FMCG brand the other day, and they were saying, oh, like, so we've got this new lipstick out, and we've got this new lip gloss out, and we want to run the campaigns at separate times so that we don't, you know, sort of waste our money. And I'm like, that's like sticking two fishing rods in the Atlantic and worrying about catching the same fish. There is so much content out there, we have to help navigate our consumers around finding the thing that they need as quickly as they can. Then we will start to positively influence their mindset, 
and start to hopefully have a conversation with them, understand their needs, perhaps sell our product, probably do it in a way <coughs> where they will actually talk about the positive experience they had. And we all know that a co-authored narrative is better than a brand one. People buy from people. And then we can get into our constant infinity loop. We like to take it a step further. Don't worry too much about all the dots and stuff on here. This is the simple version of the three layers that create what we call culture maps. So we have some long-standing intelligence tools. Um, one is, is, is a brand asset evaluator. It's the biggest study in the world of brands and consumers. Um, and at the moment, actually, a lot of our intel is focused on turning this into a, a, a real-time map of cultural human intelligence. The inner circle being about the people, what drives them, what motivates them, what are they thinking, feeling, doing. Then we map that to the brand proxies and the white space around brand proxies so that we can see where we can grow and we can track that affinity in real time. More importantly, we track that to the marketplace so we can see where are your competition going, how might we augment the market entry in a better way so that we can maximize your spend. So again, so that whole purpose for people and purpose for business. So this is a tool that we use and we refer to and on pretty much every client and certainly Yusuf will definitely testify to uh, uh, the depth that we go into with some of the BAB reports that we pull out. Um, but we have to get faster. So BAB will set the long of it. This is about the short of it. In the moment, understanding the real-time needs because back to that consumer journey, we don't tend to stand still for very long. I'm guessing most of you in the room have probably played with one of these um, at one time or another. So this is a very traditional uh, business um, value canvas. Again, we believe in cultural value. So we have a unique set of IP. Uh, we have rewritten the rule book on this. So we do work with traditional models, but we always, always bring it back to what is the experience? What is the connection that we need to make between our brand and our human and how can we make it as simply as possible? So we look at things like, what is the human interest? What are they thinking, feeling, doing? The same framework over and over again. What is the conflict that they are facing in their culture? So by this time, we've connected some of the dots with the culture map before. Um, where is our conflict? Where do we have permission to positively disrupt them? Because if you get that wrong, they're not a forgiving bunch. They're not going to come back. What's the proximity to their lives? Are we one degree separated, two degrees separated, three degrees separated from entering in the positive way? What's the proximity to other brands, other experiences, other products, other services? Um, what can impact look like? What is it currently? Where do we need to be? And then we start to get into things like the semiotics of it. What pictures are they consuming? What colours are prominent? How are we going to stand out? The depth of how we analyse is much, much more around the culture and the people and what motivates them and what desires they have. And that's how we get that tribal mentality to drive forward success. Essentially, though, at the beginning of all of it, it starts with being inherently human. It runs through every mode. I'm not going to go through this chart, don't worry. It runs through every mode of our flywheel. This is not a British term, by the way. I kind of have to check myself every time I say it. Working with like a big American organization. Um, so we have consultancy and we have business advisory and we have strategists alongside all of our traditional brand planners and content planners. And it runs through our experience, design, creation, prototyping. We do unique things like when we recruit for our qual quant at the beginning of our process, we keep in touch with those people and we ask them to play with our prototypes. So before we've even given our clickable prototypes to our clients, we've normally got videos of our, client, uh, of our consumers playing with it. So when a client's like, oh, well, that's not what my seven-year-old would do, or it's not what my wife said at dinner last night, we can go, here's 50 of your audience playing with it, and they kind of like it. Um, <laughs> You know, just data is an article. Uh, and then we kind of follow that through to testing, uh, and we keep learning with those people as we go. It also means you have a go-to-live um, audience. And essentially, all of that stuff is really brave. And so the key thing, really, when we're looking to work with partners um, with our clients, it's essentially those that have identified perhaps the need for change. They maybe don't know what that looks like, but they know it needs to happen. And they're seeking a partner for the journey. They're the sorts of people that we like to get going with. And there's one question that we ask them when we get going, and that's, would you buy from your future business? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, this one came up. I'm going to start with this, because it's actually a hard question. I don't know what the question is. 
But there are a bunch of food carts in front of this building. If you said to someone standing in line, food is politics, what do you think they would say? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> they to remain anonymous. What's in the food cart? I think that's what matters. Yeah. Yeah, I think you've got a plastic packed chicken and an organic orange juice. <laughs> So I, mean, I think the talk was really interesting um, because I think it's about the notion of, I think there's a lot of reckoning happening in the corporate world around. And so I think the quote came on the back of a story when, I'll try to paraphrase it, when, um, when Valerie was appointed, she told her son that she was getting the role and the response was, well, I, I'm sure you cannot be proud of that because of the type of impact that Danone has on the environment. So I think there's a moment of reckoning of, what kind of world are we creating through the products, through the marketing, through the type of growth that we're chasing? Um, so I think if I, look, if, I, if I look at a question like that, I think what's really fascinating to me, I think time is now and it's absolutely in our hands to force those conversations. Because if we don't do it now, then who else is going to do it? And then how much time will we have left? I don't know. Not answer. <laughs> Can you walk through examples of how you've used different frameworks on client projects? Shall I take this one? So, go go on. the go one. Um, so there were quite a few in there. The big sort of tech uh, CX stack that we shared is normally the framework that we use to start a conversation to identify where we're jumping in. And we'll get questions like, oh, I think I need a new website, or um, this product isn't selling, or we've got a new product because our competition have one and we need to go to market. And they're, they're quite standard questions that we see coming through every day. Sometimes we will have, we know we're out of date and we need to do something a little bit different, can you help us connect the dots? So that framework is essentially something we sit down with our clients and we kind of go, where are we jumping in? And how far do you want to go? It's also a really good model for working out where other partners are in play. Um, because quite often um, we're one of several agencies or consultancies working on things, so it starts to enable us to understand perhaps who the data partner is and do they need any help? Um, what MarTech do you have in place? Uh, do you have physical stores? Where are your physical stores? Do you have flagships there? So it just helps us kind of like have a construct to bring together and shape a brief together. So that's what that kind of big stack is about. It also helps us learn how to evolve. So if our jumping point is, Okay, so you do need a new website. Why? Then we probably normally go across to associated digital um, touch points and then down into MarTech. And so we sort of grow through the stack. It's not a case of, oh, we need to do all of this because that's just not possible. Um, the ones at the end were examples of sort of bite size, um, literally, okay, now we're getting going. Where do we start? Generally, we normally start with what do we need to know, what don't we know, and how do we find out the answers to that. So it normally comes down to data and insight. Um, and we have several methodologies, but we find that the ones, those two that we shared are ones that we use on pretty much every single client without fail. So we always start with setting a direction and understanding what that direction is. Uh, and then we start to break it down into sizable chunks. And, and around um, those exercises, so the infinity loop is normally really high level, then you start to go deeper into consumer journey mapping, empathy mapping, these are probably terms, especially if you're sort of experienced design thinkers, you'll have heard of all of this. Before you get to your vision mapping and then your road mapping, it's like, oh, bloody mapping. Um, and then I think, you know, stuff like the cultural value model is normally, We'll have um, people that will, our clients will come to us and say, so we've got a business problem. This is the other side of, of what we do. So it might not come from a CMO, it might come from a CEO or perhaps a CTO, a Chief Transformation Officer. Um, and they will kind of say, so this is the business problem and we need to understand how to better market. And that's when we will help them bridge the gap from their business value proposition and where they need to make money to running that through the lens of their consumers and what consumers want to buy. Uh, and so it just helps with that kind of, I said at the very beginning, the biggest shift comes down to that one question, which is, what are we going to empower our consumers to do today that they couldn't do before? Normally those kind of tools come in when you're trying to answer that question. Hopefully that's given enough of a couple of people. Cool. So uh, thank you, Karen. Thank you.